the online learning, um, my main job role is I deliver the, the mastery learning course, which is part of my job. And the course is completely online. So we deliver it through e-learning modules. We deliver it through um, social media. We also use a lot of webinars. So I would probably be doing um, a few webinars a week, and that would have been for the last few years. I think the most I did in one week was 18 webinars. By the end of it, I didn't really want to talk to anybody. I had no voice. Um, I was, didn't want to look into webcam anymore. But I got through it, and I'm still here. Um, but it can be done, and it can be a great way to um, you know, have access to information when you're not there physically. But really why we're doing the webinar is because over the years, I've sort of picked up tips and tricks. And really, it's trying to share lessons learned um, the hard way sometimes with you all. And I'd also love to hear your own experience as well, as well throughout the session. Um, so that's sort of the, the meat of the session today. And then we're just going to have a look at some takeaway tips, um, you know, sort of final things to leave you with um, so that you can sort of take those away and hopefully they might be of use to you in the future. So what exactly is a webinar? I always like this little um, cartoon strip about, um, you know, the, the age that we live in and that, you know, if we're not if people aren't using webinars, are they a newly discovered Stone Age tribe? Um, so what exactly is a webinar? And I sort of sat down and thought about this. And sort of, you know, if I'm explaining this to somebody and I really want them to understand the, what should be included in a webinar, what, what do they need to know? So I sort of came up with three things. And that a webinar should have three main components. It should be visual. Something, you know, on the screen, you probably might be using it for maybe a presentation or a PowerPoint. Um, if so, keep it very visual rather than, than text heavy. So that's sort of how I sort of look at it. The other main component is some participation uh, by attendees, um, if you can, where we might be getting questions, using the chat, using polls, or doing other interactive exercises as well. Um, so there's, as I mentioned, Webinar software has lots of different features depending on the software. So certain things you mightn't be able to do in certain pieces of, of the webinar software. The other side of it is have someone talking. As you can see, that's not me. You can see me on the webcam. But ideally having somebody to guide, that guide on the side. Um, using those conversational tones, encouraging people to share and creating a nice learning environment. Um, so for me, that's sort of, when I look at a webinar and why I'm doing it and what are the three main aspects of it, that's what, that's what I look at um, when, I, when I try and, and implement a webinar. OK, I'm going to turn on a poll. Sorry, I went too quickly. Um, I'm going to on, turn on a poll, and we'll just see you're going to see a poll come up on your screen at the moment. Um, that's participation, first component done. Um, so I'm going to launch the poll. And I'll give you probably a minute or two to have a bit of a play with it. So you'll see it's basically, have you ever facilitated a webinar before? So let's just sort of see who's, um, who's, who's basically sitting in the driver's seat like I am now. So I think we're. And you can just vote by clicking on the screen. And we're nearly there. All right. So let's go and have a look. All right. So let's close the poll. I think we're good to go. Oh, it's not registering on the screen. That's all right. We can use the chat. That's OK. All right. So what we'll do is we'll just use the chat. Um, and I think most people haven't. Um, 
most people haven't, which is good. Yeah, I just I should actually turn you back to attendees, but it'd be too much trouble. So we'll just we'll just use the chat. Okay, perfect. So I think we've got a mixture here. All right, using the chat. If you answered yes, what has been your experience? So what has worked well for you, and what didn't work well? So if you've presented a webinar before. What features of the webinar worked well? Was it the chat? Was it um, polls? Was it um, breakout rooms? What didn't work well? So for Liz, um, better to use phone conferencing. So that's a good one. Subject can be covered in smaller amounts of time. So what things worked well? So what was a really good experience, maybe what was a really bad experience? And polls when they don't work. Saving a lot of money and travel, definitely. Has anybody ever used breakout rooms before out of interest? Yeah, I'd love to hear your experience on it. They're an interesting one, um, and they're probably something that a lot of times they're done really badly, where people are sort of sent off to little group rooms, and there's silence pretty much because nobody knows what they're doing. Um, and as Liz mentioned, they're good, but it takes practice. So if you're going to be using maybe certain things like breakout rooms or new sort of features, it's worth sort of maybe testing them out and, and practicing with them. All right, perfect. Did anybody ever have a really bad experience? I had an experience once where um, I attended a session and the person didn't turn up. And they basically turned up, I think it was 20 minutes later, and they were out of breath and um, obviously had forgotten to attend the session. So um, probably one main thing is if you're going to present a webinar, maybe turn up and uh, present it would probably be a good tip. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share some of my experiences over the next few screens, things that I found worked well um, and things that sort of, mm, you know, didn't work so well, but I learned from and how to adjust for, for those sort of situations. All right. Another thing, I suppose, before we jump into it is why do you attend webinars? Like, what, what's the main reason you're, you know, you give up your time and attend them? Um, is your main thing because of location? Is it time? Is it because maybe you might register for them and you can go back and watch recordings of sessions? Um, what do you really, why do you attend webinars? What, what makes a webinar easier to attend um, than maybe going to a session? Feel free to use the chat. I think great things, Sarah, you've got a great point there. Sharing innovations and ideas, um, that's sort of brainstorming. Quick learning chunks, that's another great one from Beck. That's sort of just-in-time learning as well. Short time frame, quick and easy. Most of the time they're quick and easy. <laughs> Good one, Jai. Yeah, that's a good one, Georgia. You can sit back and take notes, um, or if it's not very interesting, I know, you know, sometimes you can be doing two things at once. If you're a good multitasker, um, you can do a few different things at once. I'm not so good at the multitasking sometimes. Um, so, you know, some people can switch off and have it listening in the background and be doing other things and sort of absorb it by osmosis. And it's also, for me, a good one is... Um, Accessing recordings of sessions, so it can be um, accessing webinar recordings so I can go back and sort of at a later stage where we don't have that luxury in a classroom, um, you know, we can't sort of be recording everything at the same time. I can always go back, especially if it's software training or something um, as well. 
Shane has a bit hard if you have a camera on you to sort of be trailing off. Yeah, very true. And a lot of people don't like to use the camera, which is interesting as well. Um, so there you go. This is this is my only time really to be on TV. It was always a dream of mine as a child to be a TV presenter. Webinars are probably the closest thing um, I can get to that. It's really just um, choice, preference. And I suppose I've been doing them for, for a while now that um, I, I don't mind using it. Um, as long as it's a good hair day, um, I don't mind using them. Okay, thanks for that. That sort of gives me a good idea of where everybody's um, coming from. All right, this could be a little bit controversial, but what's your pet hate during webinars? Um, what do you, when presenters do certain things, and I don't mind, you know, if you want to sort of throw in anything, um, any past MEC students, maybe there was a little thing that I did that bugged you. Um, but what's your pet hate? Is it that maybe people don't turn on certain features? Is it that you can't see who else is in the session? Is it audio issues? Um, what's your pet hate? What, what really annoys you during the session? So when people go off topic, presenters just reading slides, audio challenges, and we've all had the audio challenges. I know that's been a pet hate as well of, of mine. Um, Take presenting, presenter bore is boring. <laughs> maybe, maybe I wouldn't have made it as a newsreader. Um, there we go. No interactivity. Monotone voice. Things for me is sometimes I see, I attend webinars where the Q&A session is completely hidden as well. And, you know, I thought about that from a learner point of view. The presenter might be explaining what's happening, but if, if you can only, if you don't know who else is in the session or what else is going on or what other people's comments are, it's hard to get a feeling for what you're really part of. So that, that's a little pet hate of mine. Webinars that are too long, that's another pet hate of mine too. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, thanks for that. We'll keep, it, we'll keep it moving. All right. Before Robin running a webinar, I suppose it's always important to think about why you're running the session. What's the purpose of it? And it's always, I suppose, good to think about the size of your group. And different sizes will affect what's going to happen in the webinar. So if you've got basically well, probably your small, mini to small webinars, medium, you can start getting a bit more interact, or you can still have a little bit of interactivity. But when you start getting to pretty large numbers, your interactivity in the session really just starts to decline. It really becomes more like a presentation or a demonstration. So, you know, looking at the size of your group, the smallest or, you know, a tiny size, it's really like an on, online conversation you can have with people. Um, you can brainstorm, you can chat. It's probably a little bit easier to control as the facilitator as well. Once you start getting into higher numbers, it can be quite difficult to manage, especially, let's say, if it was um, 150 people were in today's session and I was trying to manage the chat, I would probably need somebody else to help me with it. I'd probably get somebody with a name starting with B from B Online Learning um, to help me with the chat. But, you know, it's thinking about the session and the size of your group, and, and that will sort of dictate what you can do in the session as well. So is it going to be basically where you're just going to give a presentation? If it's smaller groups, can you get in and share desktops? I like to share desktops if, um, for anybody who's ever done the mastery learning course or done Articulate training with us, we do maybe Articulate training over webinars and we'll share the desktop and we'll show you how to do something first and then we'll watch you doing the activity or help you do it yourself. So I really love that. But again, could only be done with smaller groups. Chat, polling. Polling is great for even large groups as well um, because you can get all that information. Um, can be great for software training, brainstorming, but that's again more so for your smaller groups. Um, and even those breakout rooms as well. You know, I'd, I'd be careful that once you go into big numbers as well, you're going to lose people or people mightn't really understand what's happening. So, the size of the group will, will depend ultimately what you can do.
depending on your audience and the amount of sessions you can run, sometimes it can be worthwhile running a practice or a test session. Um, or even giving a test link to just check people's software is working. Um, you know, we run a lot of, as I said, online courses here, and sometimes people have never attended a webinar before. And it can be a little bit daunting. And if that's where their first interaction with the course is going to be, you know, do I really want people to feel anxiety? Um, and if it's going to be over a long period of time where I'm going to be maybe the facilitator over 10 sessions and need to form some sort of bond or relationship with that person, um, starting off on a negative foot is probably not the best. So sometimes, for different things we run here at Be Online Learning, we'll run a little practice sessions um, for new students. And they only go for about 10 minutes. We log in. We get Brianna, another bee here at Be Online Learning. Gee, they're all bees. The more I think about it, the bees are taking over. Um, and that runs for about 10 minutes. And it's just to check that everything's OK using the chat, using the microphone. And it can ease certain people into a session. So it mightn't always be something that you need, but sometimes it is worth considering. And we find it, um, we get some good feedback on those test sessions. Why not use your webcam? So when you're doing webinars, um, everybody loves a good selfie, don't they? And there's a lovely little picture of me. Um, so that's what I look in cartoon format. So if I ever did get my own cartoon show, um, that's what I'd probably look like. But if you're not going to use a webcam, maybe just put a picture of yourself. Um, I was at a webinar the other day, and uh, I didn't sort of know who the presenter was, and there was no picture at the start. And I kind of couldn't connect with the person as well as I could, maybe if there was just a picture at the start and the name beside it. Because you're not in that face-to-face -face environment, you don't have those visual cues. You're probably trying to create that energy and that friendly, warm environment through other ways. So using little pictures or um, even your webcam, if you want, um, can, you know, can be really useful. And a lot of feedback we get from the Master eLearning course and the webinars over a period of time is that people like the webcam. Um, it makes them feel that they can look at something. OK. As I said, throughout the session, if you have any thoughts or comments, or your own opinions or questions, throw them in. Um, I'd really love, because I can see the chat coming through, love to hear your opinions. So again, think about the technology and its affordances. This will affect the session and how your attendees will be able to interact. Um, you know, certain, if, with GoToWebinar, and this is a perfect example, with GoToWebinar, if I didn't make you panelists, you wouldn't be able to use the chat area. But if you use GoToMeeting, the chat area is enabled by default. So, you know, depending on what you want people to do. And then, we, you know, we've problems with polls as well um, when, you've, when you've got people who are panelists. So looking at the technology and what it can do. We used to use Blackboard, Illumin, um, Blackboard Illuminate, and they had some great little features years ago where you could do a thumbs up, a thumbs down. Um, you had little smiley faces. And they were actually great for keeping the session moving rather than using the chat. I'd just go, is everybody ready for me, for me to move on? And people would give a thumbs up. But then the problem was the software, we were having issues with the software itself, and it wasn't updating. And um, we decided then to go to, go to webinar instead. Now, thinking about the webinar software, because it's, you know, it doesn't really look at, um, you know, we use GoToWebinar because it's just easiest for us to use. Have you used any other webinar software in the past? And if so, what cool features did it have? Um, I heard some people say they used WebEx before. Shane had a problem with Blackboard. And not bad mouthing any software, but it's just being aware of different pieces of software have different quirks and that allow you to do different things. Yeah, Liz, with GoToWebinar, you can show videos. So if I wanted, I could show you a, a video now. Um, so that might be interesting to look into. We also chose GoToWebinar because um, it basically allowed us to go cross to platform. Who was ever on Macs? Who was ever on Linux? Who was ever on Microsoft? We didn't have any problems. Um, 
So, you know, that's sort of, it was the easiest one. We tested out a few, but they all have their good and bad things. You know, I'm not, not here to sell any one piece of software at all. Um, yeah, Sarah, what they can do is they can ask questions, but the interaction with each other. So if you were just left as attendees, you can send me questions. So that will come through, but no one else will see those questions. If you want people to see what you can see now, you have to turn on the chat, which you've got to make people panelists and go to webinar. So we sort of found that out the hard way at the start. But, you know, it's just a matter of switching on something. All right, so that's good. Um, look, again, different technology has different um, quirks, good and bad things. Andrew is researching some at the moment. No harm in testing them out, but I would decide at the very beginning, what do you want? Do you want a chat area? Do you want breakout rooms? Do you want the option of sharing video? Do you want polls? Do you want um, maybe the ability to write on the whiteboard? Because on certain slides, you can actually get attendees to write on the screen. Um, again, that's got to be facilitated a little bit, but I would sit down and look at what you want and then try and see what software can do that, can meet most of those expectations. And I go to a company that's pretty reputable as well because we've always people updating browsers and, and, and you know, different operating systems. Just make sure the software is keeping up to date with that. Um, and that was a problem we had in the past as well. The software wasn't being updated to keep up with current technology. All right. In webinars, what should I do? I get asked this sometimes. And in GoToWebinar, you can see when people aren't paying attention, or you can see when people are sort of are not um, active on the screen. So I often get, you know, Ruth, what should I do if people aren't paying attention? And being a former school teacher, initially I think, oh, get in there and scold them. But no, that's not the way to do it. I think first and foremost, I always believe people are in charge of their own learning. And then it's within the session, if you're going to try and keep it as interactive, using the features that are in, in the session. And I'm just going to explain some tips that I do that I try and maybe hold people's attention within a session. Having some type of interaction every few slides. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be exactly every four or five, but that's sort of your ratio, having some form of interaction, whether it be chat. With the smaller groups, we actually get in and talk verbally, maybe some polls, uh, maybe some activities, drawing on the whiteboard. Another good thing would be maybe email them a worksheet to complete during the webinar. And that puts more accountability on the people, especially if it's part of a work-based program Maybe they could bring um, something to the face-to-face -face training or they could send it to the instructor. And it also makes things a little bit more worthwhile as well. So that could be, you know, email them a worksheet with some questions or things to fill in, activities to do throughout the session. Yeah, that's a great one, Liz. You know, it doesn't have to be in the webinar. You can do stuff outside of the webinar as well. Um, so, you know, it's experimenting a little bit. Ask direct questions. Now, again, this depends on the size of the group. Um, if I, We usually have about maybe 15 people max, so it usually ends up being about eight or nine people per webinar session. And I'll maybe ask people some questions. So those of you who are ex-mastery learning students will know that I do that every so often. But I find if I ask a question, so if I just started now going to everybody, what did you do at the weekend? Either I get complete silence, or else I get people jumping in together. And this is learned from the hard way. So what I do is if I'm asking a question, I always direct it to that particular person. So I'll go, Liz, what did you do at the weekend? Or Andrea, um, what's your opinion on this? And usually at the start of the session, I'll always sort of find out if people are OK to use their microphone. Um, because I know some people are in a busy office, or maybe they just don't want to use the microphone just yet. And then they'll let me know that they want to use the chat instead. So I do actually make sure that people are OK with that at the beginning. And we'll have done the practice session, so most people know how the microphone should work. And the worst thing is, is when you get that silence, 
it's like you're talking to an empty room and it's like a ghost town you know no one wants to be that guy so I like that asking questions again depends on the size of your group but a great way to get people participating um, as well another one is keep it moving and I sort of learned this the hard way as well um, being originally from Ireland, sometimes I tend to waffle on just a, just a little. So I had to be very careful with keeping my sessions moving, getting the pace right. And what I found was I actually then would double the amount of slides I have in a webinar presentation if I was doing it in a face-to-face -face presentation. And that just means it keeps things visually moving through. Um, and again, that keeps the session, keeps the energy going in the session. So it's all about the balance. The other problem is if you go too quickly, what might happen is some people who mightn't have great bandwidth, their screen mightn't load in time. And if you're flying through the slides, they'll have missed some of the screens. So, you know, keeping that balance of your pace as well. Um, if you're flicking through too quickly, somebody might miss something. That's also another good tip with video. If people are in maybe areas where the bandwidth isn't great, there may be a lag with videos as well. Um, and that's a great point, Liz. You have no control. And I think it's about, and that's another reason why we do the test sessions as well. Um, it lets us know what we're sort of dealing with. Um, and then we sort of have got backup where people could watch recordings if it's going to be a major issue. Create a warm, friendly, and learning environment. So if I had the webcam turned on, you know, I could be looking like this lady here, you know, saying off a spiel that I've practiced again and again. But I think for me, the important thing is I sort of, if I'm in a classroom situation or a webinar situation, I relate better to people who have that warm, friendly, even informal. I know sometimes we can't be too informal. Um, but creating that environment, because you don't have those face-to-face -face visual cues. That's through your voice, and maybe if you're using a webcam and through your activities, is a way to sort of create that positive energy. And hopefully by doing that, it'll get people feel, it'll make people feel okay to use the chat. Because sometimes, if you've never done a webinar before, people can be a bit, oh, I don't really know if I want to share my opinion, or... You know, well, people sort of think what I have to say is, is not really relevant. So I like to do that, create a warm, friendly environment as much as possible, um, and just sort of have a good energy in the session um, and a nice informal tone as well. Um, but again, I understand that obviously it can't be too laid back and um, if, it's, if it's in certain organize, you know, work environments as well. So um, generally that's sort of what I stick to. Use headphones, if, um, especially if you're going to be using the microphone. And sometimes people have said, oh, but I don't need to use headphones for Skype on my laptop. Well, webinars work a little bit differently. And the amount of times that I'll log into a webinar, and if it's a group of six, everybody has their mics turned on, we get static, we get dogs barking in the background, some babies crying, maybe an office chat going on in the background. Typing, you know those mouse clicks? Oh, I skipped on too quickly. You know those mouse are tapping on the keyboard? If you've got six or seven people or 20 people tapping on the keyboard, that's going to get irritating as well. So using headphones, it reduces interference. It can help limit background noise. Um, and you can always get people to put it on mute as well. But um, we find this a much better experience rather than just talking into um, the microphone inbuilt into the laptop and we've sort of learned the hard way it just reduces things like static if anybody else has experience with that let us know another one I get in sessions is um, you know I don't have time to do everything to read the chat or I was doing a presentation the other day and my throat was so dry that I really needed a drink of water you know what could I do well, sometimes I think if you're in a face-to-face -face session, you'll probably stop to catch your breath or you'll stop to grab a drink of water or, you know, you'll stop to address a question. You know, why not be able to do the same in the chat as long as you let people know? So 
a lot of our sessions run for an hour, and I'm starting to know I'm, I'm going to finish up pretty soon. But I'll sort of say to people, I'm just getting a drink of water, or I'm just going to take a moment to read the chat. And I think as long as I let people know what's happening and that I haven't gone and, you know, gone to the pub for the afternoon um, and left them there in silence, that I think people are okay with that. So it's okay to spend a bit of time reading the chat if there is a bit of silence or grab a, your glass of water um, just to let people know as well. Another one is get into the meat of the session as soon as you can. Time is precious, and I know our Friday lunchtime is very precious. Sometimes I hate when I start a webinar, and the first 15 minutes are spent either talking about the company, talking about the presenters, talking about the webinar software itself, um, going into every little detail that I sort of know or I could find out if I emailed maybe the person. So with especially lunchtime webinars like this, where we've just got a very short amount of time, getting into the meat of the session as soon as you can. And remember, you don't have to use all the features all of the time. So I suppose it doesn't have to have polls, breakout rooms, chats, using the webcam, using your microphone, um, sharing videos. But I think if you don't use some of the features, if you don't use any of the features, you're just basically giving a very passive presentation. Um, and, you know, I suppose you run the risk of maybe people losing attention as well or maybe not being as engaged throughout the session. Experiment a little. Try out something new. Give it a whirl. What can go wrong? You know, I've had my fair share of computer crashing, or the whole thing shuts down, or my microphone just won't work. Um, and I've had to sort of, you know, take a little deep breath and just either restart the session and apologize to people and get on with it. Because, you know, sometimes things can go wrong. Um, and I think it's always good to have a backup plan as well or let people know um, that, you know, your, or your internet could go. Um, or one time a fire drill happened in the middle of a webinar and unless I could drag the desktop out of me onto the street, I had to stop the session. So, um, you know, it all happens. It's like TV, really. Um, there you go. I'm getting my TV career. And finally, um, some top tips. Test out the webinar software beforehand to make sure you're familiar with all the features. Practice if you've never done it before. Keep the pace right and get people interacting if you can. Create a positive, friendly environment that will hopefully encourage people to share or feel comfortable in the session. And own it. You know, own the session. We do that in face-to-face -face training. Why not do it in webinars? You know, make it your little thing at work that you're the webinar king or queen um, and have a bit of fun with it. So, Trying out the software, seeing what it can do, practice, keep the pace right and get people interacting if you can. That will stop people checking Facebook, hopefully, while you're talking. Warm, friendly environment and own it. And if things don't work out, take a deep breath, reboot and start again. And I love this picture. Um, it'll all be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. But we have reached the end of the session today. Um, and uh, I just, again, want to thank you for your participation today and for giving up your lunchtime. I truly have, have appreciate it. And I've gone a little bit over my time. That's what happens, Irish people and time. Um, just, if you need me, my email address is there. Um, a recording of the webinar will also be emailed to you um, soon. Um, so feel free to say your goodbyes in the chat area. And again, thank you so much for making the time today um, and for sharing your thoughts and comments. I really appreciated it. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. It is Friday. Friday. Yeah, it's Friday here at uh, Be Online Learning. So when you're ready, you can always leave the session by going to file on your panel and um, exit.